It's time for Work Comp Talk, coming to you from the Pacific Worker Studio in Concord, California. It's Work Comp Talk. Interesting people talking about the issues that affect the lives of the everyday people that keep our communities moving. Sponsored by Pacific Workers Compensation Law Center, the lawyers for injured workers. With offices in Concord and Oakland, Pacific Workers is the leader in California workers' compensation, representing injured workers throughout Northern California. PacificWorkers.com, the lawyers for injured workers. Now to your hosts, Eric and Carmen. Hey guys, thank you guys for joining us once more on this podcast. We are very excited to join you today. We have an interesting topic that I think is going to relate to a lot of people that are actually going through losses of jobs right now and the mass cuts also in our wages. So I definitely think we're going to hit home with this one. My name is Carmen Ramirez and I'm joined by my co-host Eric Farber. And today we are also joined with uh, our guest, which Eric, will you introduce our guest, please? Absolutely. Eric Toscano. I'm very pleased to have Eric from the Tenant Law Group in San Francisco, California. Um, We are not broadcasting from our studio as we usually do. We are broadcasting today from from our homes because that's where we are uh, self-isolating. I do want to thank our sponsor, Pacific Workers' Compensation Law Center, the Lawyers for Injured Workers with offices in Oakland and Concord, California. Uh, representing California's injured workers in their workers' compensation and personal injury cases. Uh, Eric, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about who Eric is. Uh, He's actually a good friend of mine as well. Um, And uh, uh, I thought it would be great to have him on uh, on the podcast. Eric Toscano is a trial lawyer and the CEO and managing attorney at Tenant Law Group a San Francisco law firm dedicated to justice for Bay Area renters. They help Bay Area tenants forced out of rent-controlled apartments uh, to get a fresh start. Um, They represent tenants in disputes with landlords regarding illegal evictions, rent-controlled apartments, harassment, defective conditions, repair issues, rodents. I lived in San Francisco a long time, Eric, and that certainly was one of my issues that I dealt with, uh, pest infestations, Ouch. floods, and fires. Tenant Law Group was recently recognized by the law firm 500 as the 22nd fastest growing law firm in the United States and fourth fastest growing law firm in California. Um, and Eric, welcome uh, welcome so much to, uh, to our uh, special episode. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's... Uh, <clears throat> It, it's it sometimes it's a little difficult to remain upbeat with what's uh, with what is going on, um, and uh, really it's just it, it's just craziness. I mean, I know I've been in my house for more than a week now, uh, barely left. I've been to the store once. Um, how are you? Uh, how are you holding up? No, thanks. Thanks for asking. So I'm uh, I'm a renter in San Francisco, and uh, I have a uh, I live with my wife and our four and a half year old. My wife, who's six months pregnant, we're gonna have a, uh, a baby, and she's gonna have a baby in June. So I'm trying to keep. <laughs> thank you. Trying to keep everyone safe. Um, you know, not quite sure yet how you know exposure would affect uh, uh, um, a growing baby. So I think it's safest to keep her and my son at home. So unfortunately, fortunately, unfortunately. Um, uh, I have always, you know, I've sort of adopted the scooter model. So I'm sort of a lone soldier on the road. Um, lately, I, I commute to work on a, a scooter. Uh, it takes about 10 minutes from home to office. And so I've actually been coming into an empty building. I'm the only one I work. I don't work with the team. My whole fr- team is remote. So I'm actually, you know, talking to you now from um, from an office suite at uh, downtown at Mission in New Montgomery. Uh, wow. But there's, I don't think there's anyone else in the building right now. So I'm staying safe and, and you know, it's working out right now, but I'm trying to be respectful and just really only leave the house to take a 10 minute scooter ride from my garage to the front door here. And then I park my scooter here inside my office. So wow. we're dealing with it, but, uh, but thanks for asking. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so let's, let's kind of jump in a little bit, but tell us a little bit more about your background you know why 
you decided to, to become a tenant lawyer. Yeah, so I ended up, I, I first went out on my own, I think, gosh, it's eight years ago, and um, you know, started by practicing effectively what I refer to as door law, which is you know anything that walks through the door. But I realized like early on in my practice that what I really enjoyed the most was, you know, I, I spent a couple of years working for a big firm, you know, grinding out those billable hours, working for the giant corporate clients, anyone who could afford our exorbitant big law uh, fees. And I realized what was lacking and what the, really drove me to be a lawyer was the human connection, you know, finding people who had a problem and helping them solve problems. And it's not like we weren't doing that for our giant corporate clients, but really, you know, taking, you know, you know, representing people that were experiencing real difficulties in their life and just giving them the benefit of helping them find a solution. And it just so happened that, you know, over the course of my, you know, when I went on my own, I had taken one, you know, one or two uh, tenant, a landlord case and a tenant case and had a chance to work on them both really became interested in the area of law, but really drew, was drawn more to the tenant side. And more so than, you know, tenant rights, I really felt, you know, a calling to be a plaintiff's lawyer because I love the possibility of being able to represent someone and not having to charge them an hourly fee. We really, I really love being able to tie, you know, if we are not successful in getting you the outcome that we believe you deserve, then, you know, we won't take a fee for it. I love the contingency model and it allows me to work with a lot of people who have never worked with lawyers before. So I get to work with a clean slate. They don't have any, um, you know, and, and I'm sure it's similar for, for you and your firm. Uh, you know, they don't have any negative uh, impressions. I get to sort of, you know, we're working from a clean slate and um, get to deliver hopefully what's going to be a great experience, great, great service, and uh, hopefully a great outcome as well, too. You know, I've had the luxury, and I say luxury, of actually being involved heavily with a lot of the families that are affected by a lot of the tenant laws, uh, specifically in the Concord area. I've worked a lot with uh, Tenants Together, which is a nonprofit mm -hmm. organization that helps them out. And I do a lot of MC on the side, and I've had to MC a lot of their events here at Todos Santos in Concord. And it's just sad to see the stories, a lot of these families coming together and the things that they're put out with. Uh, I specifically remember the story of a, of a woman who constantly kept telling the landlord, hey, you know, there's water issues in the apartment, and he just refused to do anything about it. So she went and grabbed everybody from that apartment complex and they just took him to another level. And he was so upset that he actually went to protest in one of the rallies they were doing to just try to give his story and, and back up why he's treating them the way he is. And it's just, it's very sad. Yeah, it, it's one of those areas, you know, what are the basic human needs? You know, it's food, shelter, love, and it's one of those things. So, I mean, it can become... Um, very heated, obviously, you know, when you're, whether you're a member of a family or you're a breadwinner for your family, you know, the possibility of losing your home and not knowing that uncertainty of what comes next, it's really, so when people, when people contact us, they're in a really fragile, you know, emotionally tough state. So we always really make sure that we're, you know, addressing first and foremost, you know, what, you know, just providing them a voice and whether or not they, you know, retain us or you go on our website and, and use any of our free resources, you know, just to get the word, help get the word out, um, because it's it's a tough situation and especially, you know, heightened, of course, by what's going on in the world right now, the prospect of, you know, losing a home or being out on the street, not just as terrifying in and of itself, but being exposed potentially to what might be out there. So it's, um, yeah, but it, it's a very rewarding area of law. I think one, one other thing I'd add is that, you know, the, the clients that we work with most, most frequently are underrepresented in the law generally. You know, we work with a lot of immigrants, documented, undocumented. We deal with um, a lot of blue collar workers, people with disabilities, the elderly, um, you know, but, but rent, renters come in all types. You know, we've also dealt with, you know, you get a chance to work with, you know, people, you know, who are just living paycheck to paycheck and people working at startups. So I really enjoy, I love the people aspect of it. And I like the uh, diversity of people that we represent um, in this area of law. Is there one area of landlord tenant in particularly in particular that you guys specialize in is, can, can you categorize it like that? 
Yeah. So I think when a lot of people think about <clears throat> landlord tenant law, they think, oh, you, you guys do eviction defense. And surprisingly, that's not what we do. That's not our, in fact, most of the time when people come to us and say, you know, I just got a three day notice. Um, you know, my landlord's trying to evict me. He's, you know, suing me in court for an, with an eviction lawsuit that's called unlawful detainer. Um, you know, we need counsel. Uh, will you represent us? So, you know, for a number of reasons, uh, you know, one of which is that San Francisco now pr provides that service as a civil right, you know, sort of like, you know, uh, there's a civil right to, um, Lem, you know, tenant council in San Francisco it was no, you know, it was a law that was passed. I think they have it in New York. So the city offers that for free. So just like in the private sector, yes, you could go uh, in the in the uh, criminal defense world. Yes, you're entitled to an attorney if you know you've been accused of committing a crime. But you can also get your own attorney. The same is true. Uh, it just so happens that the majority of the cases that we see are non-payment of rent cases. And just as a practical matter, it's hard to run a business when people are already stretched thin. You know, making ends meet being able to pay their rent. It's just a tough practice area to be able to say, you know, and yes, well, unfortunately, we have to work for a fee. Uh, it, it's a perfect area, eviction defense, I think, for a government to provide attorneys. It's, it's, it's a perfect sector. So we don't do the eviction defense component. If you think of evictions as uh, eviction defense as a shield, imagine us as the sword. Um, what we do is, you know, after the bad acts have taken place, and we always suggest, recommend to our clients, you know, you really want to, you know, have a legal battle with your landlord. Lord, you you know, don't be living in the rent with with some very very with very few exceptions. Don't do this from a position where you're living in the rental unit. Still, uh, we specialize in tenants who have been illegally forced out of a rent controlled eviction controlled apartment. Um, you know, someone who's lived, for example, in the Mission District in San Francisco for 15 years. The landlord says, "Okay, I need you to move out in 30 days because I'm moving my, you know, name a relative. I'm moving my son, my daughter, my, you know, my mother into the unit, and you need to leave." So the tenants, with nowhere to go, enjoying you know below market rental rates, are forced to leave San Francisco, the only home maybe they've ever known, and forced to seek, you know, find somewhere to live elsewhere. Their lives get turned upside down, and it turns out the the landlord never actually moved the relative in, that they just put the, I have a case just like this right now, that the landlord just put the unit on, you know, Airbnb or VRBO and just to earn some extra money. That's, that's very illegal. And that is a perfect, that's an, you know, that's exactly the kind of case that we handle, but it doesn't have to be, you know, a fraudulent owner move an eviction. Anytime a tenant's rights are grossly abused. And I think, you know, whether it's, you know, the example you mentioned, you know, the plumbing's not working. I, I you know, how are we supposed to, you know, take a shower? We're not getting water. Uh, the toilet's not working. You know, it, it, that, that goes on long enough and forces a tenant to leave. That's a case that, you know, we could help someone out, out, out with, but I would say, Generally speaking, the kinds of cases we represent tenants on are those affirmative cases where the tenants have suffered some harm and where the tenants are in a position where they don't want to take the battle, you know, so to speak, or let us take the battle to the landlord while they're still living in the rental unit. So they're uh, to the point where they're going to vacate, you know, find somewhere secure to live and then let us, you know, sort of take it from there. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I am curious a little bit. Can you speak about the tenant? defense when it comes to that they actually that the in San Francisco at least they can actually that, that the government can pay is that what you're saying yeah um, so it was the civil it's the civil right to counsel um, it was a model I believe that was taken up it was voted on I'm, I want to get her I think it was a couple of years ago so the city itself doesn't actually hire the tenant lawyers but the uh, mayor's office they contract this service out um, to several nonprofits throughout the city I believe the biggest you know the biggest contractor with the city is the eviction defense collaborative which was doing you know it was a non it is a nonprofit uh, that prior to this going into place did basic eviction defense services that has sort of expanded its scope now that it has additional funding. And then as a disclaimer, I, I was a board member on the eviction defense collaborative, so I can, you know, speak a little bit about what they, you know, kind of what, what they do. Um, but yes, yeah, so they, they've stepped into this role and, and, it, and a client who, a tenant, San Francisco tenant who receives an eviction of any type um, can, you know, go to one of these organizations. I believe the city sends a notice along with the complaint that the landlord files and said, you know, here are some services that can help you out. You know, give them a call, show up, 
um, you know, I would say you could start with the eviction defense collaborative website. You know, if you're if you're a San Francisco tenant, and you know, there's a at the eviction defense center in Oakland. Uh, they have they're usually on a city uh, city or county wide basis. They have services like this. But the civil right to counsel is unique to San Francisco, and uh, it's available to everyone. So I actually used them when I was probably about 25 years old when I had a crazy landlord that um, <laughs> that basically. I, I had actually gotten a dog. I remember this, and he, and it wasn't in my lease, and um, uh, it, the lease was silent. The law that I knew was mm-hmm. that, uh, that that I could have one, and there were two other people on my floor that had one, and uh, so I got I got a dog, and the next day I got an eviction notice, and so wow, yeah. So I went to them, and I ended up uh, um, able to keep the dog. So uh, that was pretty cool. So um, they're, they're a great organization. I, I do remember that. And um, excellent. And, and it was sort of typical, you know, great nonprofit in this, you know, little office and the mission, I think it was when I went down mm-hmm. there and it was, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, old desks and lots of people. So uh, just trying to help San Francisco tenants. Right. So that's right. We are clearly at a very, very strange time, an unprecedented time where we've got lots of people who are scared and nervous. We have job losses that are going to be unprecedented, something that we probably have never seen before. And it may be very temporary. I mean, I keep saying that we have a public health crisis going on that is affecting Mm -hmm. everything else in our country. When the public health crisis is solved, things will turn back around. But right now we do have a public health crisis going on. We've already seen restaurants close. We've already seen uh, a lot of small businesses, a lot of people who are um, going to be out of work. And we don't know what the, you know, as we sit here today recording on March 23rd at three o'clock Pacific time, we, we haven't seen a, what the stimulus bill is yet. So being in San Francisco in the Bay Area, we went on self-isolation orders from the government very quickly. Mm -hmm. Uh, Then California followed. Can you talk a little bit about what the tenant rights are right now if somebody can't pay their rent? What do we know so far? I know we don't know everything and we're all trying to figure it out, but can you tell us what you know so far? Absolutely. So we're monitoring very closely um, actions taken at the state and local level and, you know, how it can affect um, tenant rights. So just as a, as a little, as a brief primer. So we operate in an area of law that is governed mostly, you know, there, there are some state basic tenant protection rights, but the really strong, um, you know, tenant protections that we see are enacted at a local level, at the city level. For example, um, the reason why most of our clients reside in San Francisco, Oakland, and San Jose is that they all have very strong rent ordinances that have provided, you know, just cause for eviction, which means a landlord can't just the, – the state law has always said up until the recent um, Tenant Protection Act of 2019, the one that was recently um, – it basically said that a landlord could evict a tenant for any non-retaliatory, non-discriminatory reason with 60 days notice, um, 30 days if the tenancy was a year or less. So these cities have enacted, you know, this, you know, basically what is uh, just cause for eviction, which says no, 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 the landlord can only evict you if you have a certain, if you have one of these pre-set um, good legal causes. Um, so that's sort of the, just the basic framework we're operating in. And then I think, you know, from, from my perspective as a tenant rights attorney, the gold standard for these protections is the San Francisco rent, uh, Residential Rent Stabilization and Arbitration Ordinance, sometimes just referred to as the rent ordinance. The one in Oakland, the Oakland rent ordinance um, is very similar to San Francisco's and is probably equally pretty much as strong. And in in, from my perspective, the third strongest is San Jose's. So this is where we see a lot of our cases now. At the state level, the the state has recently enacted statewide rent control and statewide statewide just cause for eviction. And without getting into all the details of that, there are a lot of um, 
exceptions and exemptions that I think were necessary in order to get the interested parties to agree and vote on this legislation. So, you know, for example, there's limitations on how old the building can be before it has eviction control, how long the tenancy must be before the tenant has uh, eviction control and rent control. And so there's actually an analysis that needs one needs to go through to determine whether a unit has just cause for eviction or, you know, rent control. So that's all by way of background to say this is the framework that we're operating in, which is, you know, some level of just cause for eviction at the state level um, and rent control at the state level for most tenancies, a much stronger uh, protections in place at the local level. But what we're worried about in the current economic environment are, you know, those tenants who either, um, you know, because of job loss, because of the economic circumstances, can't pay their rent. What 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 options do they have so they're not, you know, kicked out if they can't afford a month's rent and forced out on the street? And I think I'm, I'm going to focus on that next. But I also just want to flag the possibility that well, one other thing we're concerned is is from the landowners, the landlord's perspective, you know. A rental unit is also an investment for them. You know, they're earning income right. off of that. And if they're seeing their portfolio, uh, you know, they have other expenses in their life and there's, you know, if, if they're on a fixed income or whatever and they're seeing their retirement, you know, cut in half, then they need to seek, you know, more revenue elsewhere. So I think that there's actually a concern from my perspective that there will be greater um, pressure on landlords to engage in um, nefarious acts, the sort of, you know, evading the just cause for eviction to get these low rent controlled tenants out and put, you know, market rate tenants in. So that's, that's a concern I have. And that's just something that hasn't manifested itself yet. But depending on how long this plays out and how bad the economic damage is, I see that potentially being a problem down the road. Yeah, there's a domino effect here, right? Because these, these tenants or the landlords, it's not necessarily just an investment, they might have to they, they probably have to pay a mortgage to the bank. So the sure. bank's going to come to yeah. them and say, where's our money? It's just a domino effect, right? Let's talk, uh, let's talk about what San Francisco has done so far with regards, sure. because we've seen this. I've seen, I, I've not been able to find exactly what we need. So that's what I'm going to ask you is, what have you found about small businesses and tenants and evictions right now? Is there a moratorium on evictions? So the answer is yes. Um, in San Francisco, there is. Uh, we had heard murmurs, and we're still monitoring it, um, that at the statewide level, there would be a statewide moratorium, or at least you know some something in place in the short term against evictions based on non-payment of rent, whether commercial or residential. And as of this time, I'm not aware that the state has enacted anything. And this is something that's really you know, this is day by day. We're 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 keeping an eye on this. So, um, in San Francisco, on March 13th. So at the time we're you know at the time of this podcast, 10 days ago, we're 10 days into this. Uh, Mayor London Breed um, issued a mayoral proclamation um, in which she effectively placed a moratorium on residential um, residential evictions. And this, it basically looks like this. You know, this is kind of the short, the Cliff's Notes version of it. It's a six-page, single-space document. But effectively, if a tenant is unable to pay rent in San Francisco, and the inability to pay rent is in any way related to financial impacts um, resulting from the COVID-19 coronavirus um, epidemic, pandemic that we're all, you know, sheltering at home for, uh, mm-hmm. as long as the tenant provides notice to the landlord, doesn't say written, just has to let the landlord know within 30 days after the rent was due that the tenant can't pay due to the financial impacts, um, the the tenant, the landlord cannot proceed with an eviction. Now, how long is this order in place? Well, first of all, it's it currently is only, uh, it's only set for a period of 30 days. It says that the, this order by the city of San Francisco will only last for a period of 30 days until it's terminated this this proclamation of local emergency or upon further order from the mayor whichever occurs sooner so you know 30 days passes and there's still the stay at home she says we're going to extend this another 30 days this could continue to to last i should also add that another requirement for any tenants who wish to avail themselves of this um of this protection against um evictions for inability to pay rent is that within one week uh, the tenant has to provide the landlord with documentation or, quote, other objectively verifiable information that shows them that the tenant can't pay rent related to COVID-19 
coronavirus. So, so those are the two requirements. So let's let's do the first requirement first. Can you say that one again? Just the requirement itself. So let me uh, let me just use a real life example. Let's say your rent is due. I got to use. Um, so this came out on March 13th. Let's say that the rent is due on March 15th, and something happened. You know, a, t a renter loses their job and they can't make the rent payment on March 15th. Within 30 days, and remember, because there's 31 days in March, we're talking up till April 14th, any time within that 30-day period, the tenant can contact their landlord and say, landlord, I lost my job. I can't pay rent this month. The landlord would thereby be prohibited from proceeding with an eviction. As long as the landlord notified, the, the tenant notified the landlord within 30 days after the rent was due, so any time between March 15th and April 14th, that the rent was due and that the tenant was unable to pay rent due to the financial impacts of COVID-19. And then there is a certain amount of time that they have to provide evidence of that, correct? That's right. So it's within one week. So in that example that I gave you, uh, rent's due on the 15th. So if the tenant notifies the landlord on March 15th, well, the date that the rent's due, which is you know within 30 days after the rent is due, says, landlord, I, I can't make rent payment this month. I'm really sorry. Uh, no later than March 22nd, which is one week, uh, the tenant has to provide the landlord documentation or other objectively verifiable information that the tenant is unable to pay rent due to the financial impacts. So for example, if the tenant lost a job, you know, something in writing that says, you know, here's a notice of, you know, change in employment provided by my landlord. This, I'm sending you this that says I lost my job. And that should satisfy that requirement. And this is only in place for San Francisco as of now. Do we know if this goes for any other city as well? This is all happening so quickly. Um, you know, this would be available at the city or county wide level. So anyone who's listening who wants to know whether this is in effect, I did check on Oakland with this as well too. I didn't see any similar order in effect for Oakland, um, but uh, you'd have to check with the first place that I would go to find out if there's any sort of moratoriums or any sort of you know temporary bans on evictions would be to you know your city uh, municipal website. So you know the city website for wherever you live. And that, you know, they probably are going to have something related to COVID-19 coronavirus and just take a look at that. Um, Is there a statewide moratorium on evictions? Because I certainly heard um, Governor Newsom talk about that. Do you know if they have announced that yet? I had heard the same thing. And, and pretty much as soon as it was mentioned, you know, I was we were all sort of waiting to find out how this would play out. As of this moment, I am unaware of of any statewide measures that were taken. I believe as I was, in, you know, in anticipation preparing for this call, I think the latest that I saw was that it had been left to the cities to decide whether to individual, to, you know, local municipalities to issue moratoriums on, um, on evictions. Okay. That's the latest information I have. Are you posting information somewhere that our readers, that we can share with our readers on different Bay Area counties or municipalities? We're working on, so the, the short answer is we've posted some information on our, you know, our, our Facebook page and we send a, you know, we've been sending announcements out to our mailing list. Um, so I would say, you know, anyone, they're all, always welcome to just, Take a look at our uh, Facebook page. It's uh, facebook.com forward slash tenant law group. Um, but we may um, add, you know, I'm working with my, we're working with our webmaster. We may have put up a special page that might just deal specifically with coronavirus related, um, you know, laws that pertain to tenants throughout the state. Um, so that's not live yet, but that's something we may be uh, enacting shortly. Okay. We would like to be able to share that with our listeners and we can send that over to Pacific Workers as well to try to share with our listeners. Uh, let's uh, let's make sure that we got the second part of the of of that because my guess is is that uh, most of the Bay Area counties will follow what San Francisco is doing um, with the moratorium on evictions because not only is it bad to put people out on the street but it's certainly bad to put them out on the street in the middle of an epidemic. Yeah. Right? So my yeah, guess is absolutely. from a public health safety standpoint. <clears throat> they probably will all be doing this as well. So um, I, mm -hmm. the second part is, is what evidence should they be gathering up? So if assuming that other municipalities, and I do think that's a, that's a valid, I think that's a good assumption too. Um, you know, a lot of the cities have sort of taken their, 
you know, followed kind of San Francisco's lead on some of this, especially when it comes to tenant rights protections. Um, so anything, any sort of documentation or proof that one would have, and I'm just trying to think of different scenarios, um, that would show a loss of income or an inability to pay rent. I mean, I would start with the question, why aren't you able to pay rent? And if your answer to that question is, I lost my job, well, what could you show your landlord that would prove that you lost your job? Um, you know, and, and I think, um, could they get something from their uh, from their employer to say the reason is is because of business loss, um, your restaurant, that type of thing? I mean, I'm sure employers right now would 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 probably do that for their employees, correct? I think so. I mean, if these are if these are you know layoffs, they're just you know they're just economic, you know otherwise wouldn't have happened, but for the economic environment, I don't think that would be a problem. I think that the way the, and I'm just going to say that I, the way that the San Francisco uh, proclamation is worded, it sounds like a, you know, a, 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 a notice that you've been, that you've lost your job plus, you know, your, your verbal, um, your verbal statement that this was related to COVID-19 would probably be okay too. But just, I think a safer route is exactly what you're suggesting, which is, you know, if, if you lose your job and it's causing an inability to make ends meet, including payment of rent, see what your employer can do. Uh, you know, ask your employer, say, I, I understand. Can you please just to, you know, give me a two sentence that, you know, on this date, um, we ended employment with this employee. Um, this is part of a, you know, is scaling back as a result of the COVID-19, the economic impacts of COVID-19 coronavirus. That would be the perfect piece of evidence to be able to give to a landlord. Uh, that would certainly satisfy San Francisco's proclamation. And we do expect that this is going to run out towards uh, towards the other Bay Area counties, probably most of California. California has taken the lead on all of this. The federal government has even talked about it to some extent, but I don't know mm -hmm. if the federal government actually has the power to do that. We'll we'll kind of see where that plays out. Eric, I want to thank you for um, for for being with us. I want to make sure. Um, that people can get a hold of you during this time, or we can at least um, maybe you'll be kind enough to come back into a Facebook live um, and to be able to, uh, to talk about some of these or just to answer a Q and a, would that be mm -hmm. possible? I would love to. Thank you so much for having me. It would be my pleasure. Uh, just, you know, tell me when and where, and I'm, I, I'm happy to, to, to help out the, um, our, our webs for, we're going to be, like I said, we're probably going to be posting information about, you know, related to this and, you know, tenant rights, tenant rights laws generally on our website, it's tenant law group, SF is in San Francisco.com. And our phone number for any, for anyone, a free case evaluation is 415-915-7445. Um, so those are a couple of resources people can use. And our Facebook page, again, is facebook.com forward slash tenant law group. This is great information. Thank you guys again for joining us. And one more time, where can they reach you guys at the phone number for those of you guys that just need to get a pen out? Sure, no problem. 415-915-7445. This has been great. Thank you guys for joining us. Both Eric's joining me today on the podcast. It's been a pleasure. And once again, stay safe out there. Follow the rules. Stay in your homes. And thank you for listening to Work Comp Talk. Share this podcast with others. Share this information. Make sure you guys subscribe to our channel. We are also available on social media. We are Work Comp Talk. You can find us on Facebook, on Instagram, on YouTube, and once again, this is Carmen Ramirez, co-host and producer of Work Comp Talk. Our next guest or next episode will be coming shortly. And of course, if you would like to connect with us, if you have questions, you can simply connect via email and that's at connect at workcomptalk.net or you can visit workcomptalk.net. We want to thank our sponsors, Pacific Workers Compensation Law Center, the Lawyers for Injured Workers. Pacific Workers is the leader in California applicant workers compensation representing injured workers in their right, in their fight for justice against the insurance companies. And you can find them at their website at www.pacificworkers.com. I'm Carmen. Eric, would you like to say bye? Bye. Thanks for joining us and stay safe out there or in there. Great. <laughs> Right? <laughs> Not out <Yeah>. there. <laughs> right. You guys be careful. Stay safe.